Um, today we're going to talk about nourishing your heart through um, good nutrition. So my, my name again is Caitlin. I am the clinical nutrition manager here at Monadnock Hospital. So I oversee all of the nutrition and diabetes programs. Um, our nutrition program supports the cardiac rehab program um, that Liz Peters runs. Um, so we kind of all work together to get the participants uh, you know, in, in top shape after any cardiac issues that they might have. Um, this seminar was brought on because this is Heart Month, February is Heart Month, and the American Heart Association is celebrating 100 years this month. So we thought it would be nice to you know, put the seminar on for that occasion. Uh, my goals for you today are to understand the why of how nutrition affects cardiac health. I think a lot of times we're told, you know, don't eat sodium, don't eat fat, um, but we're never, it's never really explained to us why we don't want to do those things. So I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of the science so that you understand what it's doing to your body when we are consuming those foods. Um, and then we're going to talk about which nutrients that we want to add more of in our diet, right? It's not all about taking things away. It's about what healthy things can we add back in. So there's four key nutrients that we're going to go over today. Um, these are kind of the heavy hitters when we're talking about cardiac diet. We have cholesterol, fat, fiber, and sodium. I'm sure most of you are familiar with all of those. So the first one that we're going to talk about is cholesterol. And when we talk about cholesterol in our body, um, our body does make cholesterol on its own. Um, it is, you know, we do need it. It does make our cells, it makes hormones, it makes vitamins. So it is a, you know, it is a vital um, part of our, our body and how it works. Um, it's only if we have too much cholesterol that that puts us at risk. Um, some people, unfortunately, genetically make more cholesterol than others. You know, we, we have some people who eat a fairly low cholesterol diet, but theirs is still high, right? Because it's their body's making too much. So just a little background so that you can understand like what we're talking about throughout the um, presentation. When we're talking about getting a lipid panel done, right? Like you get Get your lipid panel done pretty much every year when you go to your primary care physician, and they'll give you four numbers. They give you the total, which is the sum of all your cholesterols. They'll give you the HDL, which is that helpful, quote unquote, good cholesterol. That's the one we want to be high. Um, the LDL, the not helpful, bad cholesterol, if you will. That one we want to be low. And then triglycerides are a type of fat found in the bloodstream. So when you, you, know, when you get your lipid panel, they will tell you, um, if you're high or not, you know, your total should be less than 200. HDL should be greater than 40 for men, 50 for women. But again, the higher the better. Um, LDL, ideally less than 100. You know, as we start getting up to, you know, the 120s, then that really um, kind of puts us at more risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, and then triglycerides should be less than 150. So this is just kind of a nice infographic of, you know, why we want that HDL to be high. Um, HDL is protective, so it removes plaque buildup in our arteries. So we want more of it, right? We want it to be doing, doing that job all the time. Whereas LDL, that, you know, quote unquote, bad cholesterol, um, contributes to plaque buildup. So that's why we want that one to be very low. Um, so they kind of work opposite each other to, you know, either clog or unclog. So when we're talking dietary cholesterol, this would be the cholesterol that we're consuming, right? So we, our bodies do make it, but we also consume cholesterol in the form of animal products. So things like meat, dairy, um, seafood has a surprisingly high amount of cholesterol, um, eggs. So all of those things, anything from an animal, will have dietary cholesterol. And we just really want to limit how much dietary cholesterol we're consuming. Because again, too much can lead to a risk of heart disease. So how do we raise HDL? You know, I get that question a lot after we're talking about, um, you know, your labs. There are some things we can't change, right? Like we can't change our genetics. Those are, you know, really non-modifiable. We're kind of stuck with those. But that only accounts for 20% of our health. So 80% are these modifiable risk factors. So things like making changes to your diet, if, if your diet needs a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a boost there, um, you know, maintaining an exercise program, quitting smoking if you smoke cigarettes um, or vaping, uh, managing your weight, and then if you do have diabetes, monitoring those blood sugars. So those are all 
things that we can change, you know, things that we can work on to help raise that HDL, which again, will help keep those arteries clear of um, blockages. So when we're talking dietary cholesterol, we wanna keep it less than 200 milligrams a day. So I put some common foods up here with cholesterol just so you could start to see you know, which ones uh, we wanna limit. So one egg has 187 milligrams of cholesterol, so on the higher end. Uh, but there are a lot of studies, I know most of you have heard probably throughout your whole life, eggs are good, eggs are bad, don't eat eggs, we should eat eggs. So, you know, they're finding more and more that the cholesterol from eggs is not as um, detrimental to our health as, as they once thought. So, you know, we still allow eggs, it's just kind of looking at that big picture. Um, so, you know, things like a tablespoon of butter, 31 milligrams, three ounces of lobster, 124. So, you know, in the summer when you have that lobster roll, um, you know, you just want to have less cholesterol for the rest of the day, right? Maybe choosing some leaner proteins the rest of the day to kind of make up for that. Uh, so in summary, when we're talking cholesterol, we want to reduce our intake of high fat foods, as well as foods with a lot of cholesterol. We want to keep that under 200 milligrams a day is really that, uh, that number that we want to keep it below. Uh, maintaining an exercise program. Obviously, you want to get that okayed with your doctor, um, but that can also help lower those LDL cholesterol levels, those bad cholesterol levels. And then getting regular labs is another really important thing that we always stress, um, getting that lipid panel done. And if there are anything, you know, out of whack, that's kind of like a check engine light. So we can look at that and say, okay, what's going on in your lifestyle or your diet that maybe we can make some changes to get that back down um, so that we don't then have high numbers for, for several years in a row. Does anyone have any questions so far? Go ahead. On the HDL, is there instances where you can have too much? Yes. There's not a lot of research on why that happens or what could happen, but we do have some patients who, you know, it's, it's like 70, and you, you never see it that high. So that can happen. It's really not. It's, you know, it's kind of just like it doesn't do anything bad or good. It's just kind of there. Um, but that, I'm glad that you brought that up because we've, we've been seeing that a lot more, and we don't really know, you know, the long-term effects of that. Someone had a question yeah, in the back. Other than the eggs, if you take all the other sources of cholesterol that you had up there, mm -hmm. are they all about the same in terms of badness or whatever you want to, however you want to describe it? Um, that's a good question. I, I would say that they're comparable, yeah. Um, you know, they do come from different sources, but, but they're comparable because they're all the same um, molecule. Okay. So again, just in summary, get those labs drawn every year. Um, the next nutrient that we're gonna cover is fat. So there are three different types of dietary fat that we consume regularly. There is saturated fat, which is found in animal products. Um, trans fat, which is a man-made fat. Um, they make it by adding hydrogen to liquid vegetable oils. This is um, what margarine is made out of, for example, Crisco, those types of things. Um, you know, and they made those back in the day to extend the shelf life of food. So, you know, cookies used to last maybe three days on the shelf. Now they last two weeks, two months, you know. Um, so it, when they were made, they were very helpful because now we could have food with longer shelf lives. Um, you know, as we did more nutrition studies over the years, we're finding now that that trans fat is actually not very good for us. So, try the, you know, we're trying to get it taken out of most foods. So you'll kind of see it being phased out over time. And then the unsaturated fats are the healthy ones that we want to focus on. So we want to get more of those in our diet. There's two subtypes to those. There's polyunsaturated and monounsaturated. And that just refers to the molecular structure of them. You trans fat, <clears throat> you said of taking them out, what are they going to replace it with? Something else is negative for long life? Uh, one would hope not, right? Because, you know, they're, they're hopefully going to replace it with um, maybe a saturated fat that's not man-made. Um, and, and I'll talk about that a little more. I'll touch on, on kind of how they did that too um, in, in a second. Um, this is just to kind of explain to you why when we say eating a high fat diet can, can help block those arteries. So on the top here we have saturated fat, on the bottom we have trans fat. These two are both very straight, 
you know, their molecular structure is very straight. So they stack very easily on one another. So if our diet is high in these fats, that's what's stacking really easily in our arteries. Whereas this unsaturated fat in the middle, you know, it's, it has a little bit of a different shape and it doesn't stack very well. So, if, you know, I put these Tetris blocks just to kind of give you that visual of, you know, if, if all of these were to come back together, they wouldn't stick together because that unsaturated in the middle doesn't um, allow for that. So that's really breaking down why we want to have more of those unsaturated fats. Um, again, the saturated fats, the one we want to limit, it does raise LDL cholesterol. So instead of the, you know, the high fat dairy, we want to do the lower fat, like the 1% milk. Um, instead of those really fatty marbled steaks, we want to do lean beef, venison, poultry, um, poultry without the skin versus with the skin. That's where most of the fat tends to be on poultry. And then coconut oil. I know this one is kind of a hot topic um, in recent years because um, coconut oil is kind of everywhere. Um, but it is still a solid saturated fat. So we still, still want to limit it and focus on those liquid vegetable oils instead, like olive oil. So trans fat, this can kind of answer your question a little bit better. So again, mostly found in packaged foods. Um, it, it again raises that LDL cholesterol, so we want to limit our intake of this. And there really isn't any recommendation. They really want you to have zero grams of trans fat per day. Um, but the, you know, the FDA said, okay, less than two grams a day is, will be our recommendation for now. Um, so when you see this label here, let me see if I have this. You can see where it says trans fat zero grams. So on the label, it does say zero grams. Um, when they started taking trans fat out of foods, a lot of food manufacturers said, OK, we're going to change our serving size so that we can get under that threshold. Um, so even though it says zero, there can be a, a minuscule amount in there. Um, so the best way to tell, and really the only way to tell, is to look at the ingredients list. So this partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, or if it says hydrogenated. So that's, that's like that key buzzword that you want to look for. That means that this product does have some trans fat in it. So we would want to limit our intake of this. Um, so when I say it can be zero, um, it could be all the way up to like 0 0.4, and they don't have to put it on the label. So if you're having more than one serving of this, that's when it would start to stack up a little bit. Uh, unsaturated fats, so these are the good ones, you know, the healthful ones that we want to get more of into our diet. These lower LDL cholesterol, unlike the other two. So we want to focus on things like olives, olive oil, you know, nuts and seeds, um, vegetables like avocado that have a little fat in them, and then fatty fish, so your salmon, tuna, that kind of stuff. So just in summary, when we are talking about dietary fat, we want to reduce the amounts of the saturated fat and the trans fat that we're taking in on a daily basis, because again, those will raise that LDL cholesterol. Um, we want to increase the healthy fats, so trying to add more fish into your diet. Um, if you don't like fish, a fish oil supplement could be a good kind of supplement to still get those healthy fats um, and all those omega-3s that, you know, all the good things that are in the fish that maybe, you know, you're not going to get because you just don't like salmon that much. Um, and then lastly, when in doubt, just reading those labels and making sure that there isn't any trans fat in that product. Does anyone have any, any questions moving on? Good? All right. So the next nutrient that we're going to cover is fiber. Uh, the fiber that we're going to focus on today is soluble fiber. There are two different types of fiber. Insoluble fiber is found in most sources that soluble is. So a lot of times they're in the same product. Um, they are only found in plant-based products. So no, no animal product will have fiber in it. Um, and the fiber helps reduce LDL cholesterol. So it does that by absorbing water in your intestines and it forms a little bit of a gel. And that stops your body from being able to absorb that cholesterol at all. So great to, you know, if you are gonna be having those, you know, higher fat meals, great to have some vegetables with it because that will help you not absorb all that cholesterol. And when we're talking how much, we want to do 5 to 10 grams of soluble fiber per day. Where, do, where can we find soluble fiber? Um, it's found in all vegetables, fruits, beans, legumes, and then most whole grains like oats um, as well. 
and it, you know, it's, it's a little bit higher in other foods, but most fruits and vegetables are gonna have a little bit. So again, when we're talking fiber, we wanna start slow. If you do not currently consume a lot of fiber, um, we wanna start eating that slowly over time. Um, if you eat too much fiber at once, it can cause a lot of GI upset, gas, you know, upset stomach, just not a lot of fun at parties, you know, so we don't wanna do that. Um, increasing your water intake as you're increasing that fiber. So you want to, you know, because it's going to absorb that water, we want to drink more water. Otherwise, we might, um, you know, might lead to constipation if we're having too much fiber. Um, when we're talking total fiber daily, so again, that insoluble and that soluble, we want to do 25 to 30 grams, um, with 5 to 10 of that being that soluble fiber. And this can really help lower um, LDL cholesterol levels quite significantly. When, they, when they've looked at the studies, it's you know, 11 points decrease of your LDL with every, I think it was five grams that you consume. So, so it's, very, you know, it's very easy to kind of start to add these things into your diet. Um, and then if you're having a hard time getting enough, you know, if you're having a hard time getting enough fruits and vegetables, you can do a fiber supplement. So something um, with facilium husk or methyl cellulose you know, the very standard, like Metamucil comes to mind. Um, that would be a good one to start. And then again, just starting slow with that supplementation. Does anyone have any questions about fiber? Sure. When you said 25 to 30 grams of fiber, what does that translate into, you know, like if I, for a day, is that a bowl of, you know, oatmeal and, you know, like, how much is that? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it depend on, on what foods we're talking, but you would really, you would really have to have fruit, whole grain, and um, veggie at almost every meal to kind of make make that up. So, just trying to get a little bit of, of you know different color at every meal would would really help quickly reach that goal. Um. It, it would be things like corn, right, that kind of just go through, go through your system but don't get digested. So we still need that for health, right? It helps our GI system kind of move on through, but we're not absorbing that fiber. Yeah, that was a, that was a good question. All right, last but certainly not least, this is honestly probably the, the most important one out of all of these, is sodium. So, you know, we talk a lot about limiting sodium for a cardiac health. Um, but why do we say this? I think this is really helpful to understand. So when we eat too much sodium, it pulls too much water into our blood vessels and it causes them to expand. Um, that increases your blood volume and it makes your heart have to work a lot harder to push that volume through. So that is kind of the reasoning behind that low sodium recommendation. So the dietary guidelines for Americans recommend 2,300 milligrams throughout um, you know, every, every life season of life. Uh, for cardiac, there, you know, there are a little bit varying recommendations, but 2,000 to 2,300 um, is generally recommended for risk of hypertension, risk of stroke. And then when we get to chronic heart failure or you know, kidney disease and heart disease kind of mixed together, we might need a little bit lower sodium, so like 1,500 milligrams. Um, this can, can vary according to the individual. Um, but the average American, I would say, probably gets like 3,500 milligrams of sodium a day. So, you know, as a, as a society, we definitely get far too much every day. Um, just to give you some context, one teaspoon of salt has 2,300 milligrams of sodium. So, you know, when, it, when we're talking baking or cooking, you know, that really isn't that much. A teaspoon's pretty small. Um, sodium does occur naturally in foods. It occurs naturally in the ground, so uh, fruits and vegetables do naturally have some sodium in there. But the majority of the sodium that we consume is from processed foods. Um, a healthy average adult only needs about 200 to 500 milligrams of sodium to, to function um, properly, so that's where we just kind of keep hitting that home is that you know, we as a society definitely eat too much processed foods and we definitely get too much sodium on a daily basis. So how can we reduce our sodium? It's very difficult, right? I mean, we rely on a lot of convenience foods. Um, you know, we're always trying to make mealtime easy and quick, and that comes with more salt, unfortunately. So trying to ditch the salt shaker at the table and not adding salt to your food before you've tried it. 
Um, looking at the labels is probably the, my number one recommendation. When you're buying those products that are you know, in a package, just making sure that they're not too high in sodium. You know, your really heavy hitters will be like your canned soups, your frozen meals, those we really want to look out for. Um, oftentimes meat is injected with a saline solution, so trying to find meat that is not injected with that, because that'll just add a lot more sodium that you really won't notice when it's not there. They don't say that on the label. It's very hard to find. It's very small print. You almost need a magnifying glass. Yes. Yes. So you, you, it takes a minute to even find where it is on the package. Is that an FDA requirement? It's not a requirement, but it's a, it's a flavor enhancer. So uh, well, they. I'm saying divulging that on a label. That's that a great question. I'm not sure. I've never seen it. Yeah. I, I do check labels regularly. Yeah. I wouldn't think it is then, because I think if the FDA requires it to be labeled, it's usually a little. A little more obvious, right? Well, there are a lot of the uh, poultry and stuff. If you look, it says it's got X percent of added yes. water with whatever. Exactly, yeah. It will say like 2% saline solution. So, But again, it, it is. It's, it's fine print, so we definitely want to be looking at that. So it's not just draining out the canned veggies. It's actually pouring all the water off, heating it in clean water then. Um, you don't need to heat it, but if you have like a colander, just dumping the beans or the veggies in there and just rinsing them with the water. And that takes away about 40% of the sodium. So makes it a lot more attainable to have like a healthy chili that, you know, that's cardiac friendly. Um, so you'd always recommend rinsing that. Or buying low sodium versions as well. They do have lower sodium versions out there now. Um, condiments are another sneaky source of sodium. So buying the lower sodium ones. I definitely recommend that as well. Um, and then just using seasonings to flavor food instead of salt. Um, you know, it, it's definitely a learning curve, right? Not all of us have the time to cook, but trying to add more spices and herbs and you know, maybe some lemon juice instead of so much sodium. And then you, know, you can kind of um, work on your palate through that. Um, I will say I have a lot of patients who tell me that everything tastes terrible when they first start doing lower sodium. They're like, I, I, I don't like it. Like none of my food tastes how it used to. But over time, they do start to get used to it. And then when they have those salty foods that they used to love, they say they don't like them as much anymore. So it is, it is an acquired taste. It does take a little bit to get used to it, um, but we can get there. So again, just not adding salt at the table, checking those labels, um, making sure that you know, the amount of sodium is, is reasonable for getting that 2,300 a day, um, trying to flavor your food with herbs. Um, and in, in your binders, in your handouts there, there is a, a nice handout that talks about how to use herbs and spices. So it kind of goes over like what goes well with chicken, what goes well with beef. Um, and it's a nice refresher, right? Like we get stuck cooking the same things, I think. So it's nice to kind of branch out. Um, when we talk about dining out, that's another place where we're looking at a lot of sodium. You really wanna either look at the menu ahead of time if it's like a chain restaurant, or if it's a more local restaurant, just ask, ask the wait staff how it's prepared, ask if they can make it with less salt or less butter. Um, oftentimes they're pretty happy to accommodate you. So um, just in summary, when we're looking at those four key nutrients there, we wanna focus on the healthy fats looking out for that excess sodium, really trying to cut that down a little bit, um, decreasing the amount of dietary cholesterol that we're consuming, and increasing that fiber intake over time. And all of those things will help lower our blood cholesterol levels, which will really you know, go a long way to protect our heart in the long run. Okay, so if you were really inspired by this talk um, and you wanna meet with a dietitian and kind of come up with your own personalized plan, we'd be happy to meet with you. Um, so you can give us a call or you can just ask your uh, doctor for a referral and they can send that over to us. All right, does anyone else have any other questions? I'm surprised you have not the coconut oil but canola because a dietitian from New Ipswich said uh, don't uh, be using canola oil. Okay, so her question was about canola oil, whether we should be using that one. There is a lot of um, information out there about different types of oils, um, but the, the majority of the ones that are liquid at room temperature are a little bit better than the coconut oil. So olive oil might still be better than the canola. Um, 
So there's a little bit of a hierarchy, but we still want to see those liquid vegetable oils versus the solid ones. All righty. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to hand it over to Liz. Thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. And um, when folks come to cardiac rehab, there are so many different risk factors that we have to talk about or talk to our patients about um, and where they want to start. And diet is a huge part. And I just remind folks uh, that you, how many times a day do you eat? Two to five times that you're consuming food. So there's a lot of opportunity to make healthful choices and don't feel like, oh shoot, I can't um, make, I'm not really sure what to do. I had a bad breakfast. The next meal, add some fruits and vegetables. So there's always a lot of um, opportunity there. So happy heart month. Um, we're going to talk about listening to your body, information to observe, to take this information to your doctor's appointment so that you can have a successful visit. And then a little bit on exercise and heart health. So one of the components of cardiac rehab is developing monitoring skills to use with exercise, but also within your daily um, activities. And getting to know your body is something that we teach <coughs> folks because the better that they can kind of listen to what our body's telling us, they can take steps towards um, improving choices, um, seeing how they feel with exercise and whatnot. So just being aware of how you are. And it's sounds, um, it's not very, it's not very tangible, which I personally like numbers and this and I can fix this, but this is more like, how do you feel? Um, and we'll kind of get into why this is important. So assessment of the objective and subjective signs and symptoms. So we'll go over different equipment that you may already have at home and things to kind of assess yourself. So you, you can be your own healthcare um, professional in a sense so that you can have a good uh, visit when you see your doctor. And then the goal is to be able to confidently sit down with your doctor and say, this is what's going on, this is how I'm feeling, and they can say, all right, this is what we think based on my knowledge of this system, um, and then hopefully you can have a good plan of action in place. So here is this sort of how do you feel kind of question. And it's, again, it's nothing that you're going to definitely come up with and be like, I feel this and I'm going to do something with it. You're going to just observe and think, all right, how do I feel right now? Um, and by doing that, it gives you a sense of, you know, what is your body telling you? And what, what can you um, use that information for? So, for example, do you feel calm, rushed, agitated, irritated, fearful, alert, or relaxed, peaceful, um, confident? And then what is your body telling you physically? Are your muscles tense? Are you kind of sore? Did you exercise too much? Um, you know, are you achy? Could it be a side effect from a medicine? Um, tingly, warm, cold? You know, these are just a whole bunch of different descriptors about how to kind of pay attention to what our bodies are telling us. Um, are you breathing into your shoulders or, in, or into your belly? You know, so even if you just calmly sit for a moment, and we can do this right now, just kind of hang out and go, all right, how am I doing right now? Like, is my breath in my shoulders? I'm tense, I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> yes, yes, for me. And where, you know, is it in my belly? Am I relaxed? You know, that sort of thing. And I read this statement that really stuck with me, and it said, that your body whispers before it screams. And that's one of the things that we try to teach our patients is like, what is my body telling you before like something kind of happens? All right, so some measurements that can be taken at home. You don't even need anything. Two fingers, all right? So finding your pulse. And I want you guys to find your pulse right now, <laughs> if you want to try. Um, but there are different locations, and we do this in class all the time because this is something that um, when you go into your doctor's visit and they say, oh, well, you know, you, I was feeling kind of lightheaded and, and you can go, and I felt my pulse was racing or it was really slow or is irregular, all right? So we teach folks how to find a pulse and you can find it on your um, wrist right here, on your neck. I've had patients find it at their temple. They're sitting there like, yep, I can count from there. And what we usually do, and you can do this easily without any devices, um, if it's regular, Time yourself for 15 seconds, multiply, and then you have your beats per minute. 
If it's irregular, you're going to have to do a count for a full minute just because we can't <coughs> mathematically um, extrapolate for the full minute. All right. So one of the things that our pulse can tell us is, is if it's regular, if it's irregular. It can't tell you what the arrhythmia may or may not be, but it goes back to, well, I usually have a really regular pulse, but now I'm noticing some skip beats and I felt a little lightheaded. Those are really good descriptors to be able to tell your doctor. Um, next, we have a blood pressure cuff. How many people have blood pressure cuffs at home? Yeah. And have you had them checked with uh, your office visit with somebody actually listening to see how close they are to, um, to their reads? I would bring in your blood pressure cuff to your office visit um, just to see like where it is. But these are really nice things to have at home. Again, if you have a medication change or, or if you're just not feeling well, you can have your blood pressure, um, check your blood pressure and keep, keep notes of that. Um, when you take a blood pressure, think about it's going to vary through the day because you're, we're alive, we're moving, we're emotional, we're human beings. And that's normal. So if you want to compare, think about like if I take it in the morning, before or after medicine, compare apples to apples. And what we teach our patients is we're really looking for trends. We're looking to see, you know, um, with my plan of care, with my diet, with my medications, are my blood pressures um, improving? Are they, um, are they starting to like increase a little bit? And I'm like, yeah, I know, so maybe I'm not eating so great. I went out to eat a couple times and it just kind of keeps you on target to see like how, is, how well your plan of care is working. All right, and, and like I said, it's really about the trends. Generally, one blood pressure doesn't make or break anything unless you're symptomatic um, and if it's too low or something, but having that information um, will help. The next one is pulse oximetry. Some folks have these. Um, usually if folks have uh, underlying um, pulmonary issue, they may, and they have to know their saturations because they're not oxygenating their blood well, um, or they're on oxygen, um, or we have patients with heart failure, we'll check their oxygen saturation to see that um, how well their muscles are being perfused. But this is another nice thing to have um, in your toolbox. It also takes your, your pulse, okay? So um, you can check it with finding your own pulse, but this will also be another way to check your pulse at home. And these measurements here that we've already discussed, they may help evaluate the subjective feelings that were kind of like, hmm, I'm sort of feeling off, but I don't know why. And there's not always an answer, but it's just all of you and all of our patients, we say, you know, you can be, um, you're the sleuths. You're, you're just finding these things out and then bringing it to your provider. So the next thing is a scale. Everyone, most people have a scale at home. Uh, most people, you know, it's more so like, I want to lose how many pounds, and you're kind of watching that, which, you know, great goal once you get a good diet, you got some movement going on, good behaviors, and being consistent with that, sure, the pounds will start to start to adjust. However, when we look at weight from our perspective, we're usually looking to see if anyone's holding on to fluid. So they have an, incre an increased fluid retention, and that can be dangerous. Um, like Caitlin was saying, like there's just more fluid on board and then your heart has to try to pump this around and you know maybe your kidneys aren't filtering it like it should and it just kind of sets, finds its way somewhere. Um, and it doesn't disappear, but it usually finds its way into some part of our body. So what we recommend is get up, go pee, get on the scale every morning and then just compare those numbers to the other numbers um, and see where you are. If you're up three pounds overnight, we say, let your doctor know. If you're up five pounds in a week, let your doctor know. None of that is going to be um, muscle tissue or fat tissue. It's most likely going to be fluid. And then where the fluid may go, this is, again, just where it may kind of land in our body. So what we do is we say, oh, your weight's up. Let's double check and see where where it may be because if it's gravity thankfully i guess pulls it down to your leg so it's away from your lungs um, but if you can press into your your leg and there's an indent then that's the fluid right behind your your skin 
and that's not a normal thing. And there's lots of different reasons for having um, this edema or this fluid retention. So, you know, obviously we're looking at cardiac reasons, but there are a lot of different variations of, of why. Um, so it could land in your legs, okay? It could be in your um, abdomen, so maybe you have a loss of appetite. That's another thing, you're kind of like, yeah, I haven't been eating well, or I'm kind of feeling full, or I'm kind of feeling nauseous. Again, one of those subjective feelings that you're noticing about um, your day to day. Maybe it's your rings are feeling tight, okay? It's landing there. Um, perhaps your heart's unable to pump it where it needs to, so then it kind of backs up into your lungs and folks will feel short of breath, difficulty breathing, chest pain. Obviously, any of those, you wanna call 911 or get to the emergency room because we don't know what it is, but we wanna err on the side of caution that let's get this addressed. And then maybe some um, puffiness around the face and eyes. Now, an easy thing for our patients, we say, hey, call your doctor. This is something you can do at home. You measure yourself, you go, yeah, I'm up a little. I'm noticing some swelling. I'm kind of feeling, you know, um, maybe some bloating or whatnot, and they'll say, you're on Lasix, maybe um, they'll increase your dose for a couple days, they'll put you on a dose for a couple days and help your body get rid of um, that extra excess fluid before it kind of builds up and builds up. All right, and finally I have up here is a glucometer. So anyone who has diabetes should have a glucometer, actually anyone who has diabetes who is on a medicine to decrease your blood sugar should have a glucometer. Um, sometimes folks come in and they'll say, yeah, I'm on metformin, which doesn't decrease your blood sugar drastically. It does gradually over time. And I say you still, you know, that you still should have a glucometer because instead of waiting three months for your doctor um, to do your check, your A1C, to check to see what that average is over time, I think that the person should know day to day. You wake up, check your fasting, see what it is. You get real-time feedback. You can make real-time adjustments um, now instead of waiting and going, yep, it's still high. And you're like, okay, well, I'll try again. But you can have some more flexibility and more control with that. Okay. So paying attention definitely to your blood sugars. Blood sugar, another risk factor for heart disease. Um, when our blood sugars are elevated, it does a lot of damage to the interior of all those vessels and it increases your, your risk for heart disease that much, like four times that much more. And if you do have diabetes, um, we also recommend following up with a diabetic educator because these folks talk about food, exercise, medicine, they can make adjustments um, independent of your primary care and it's just another resource for you to help you manage whatever um, ailments you have, all right. So any questions so far with these? <clears throat> All right, so those are the objective things that we can measure, get numbers and see like what, what our body's telling us. Know your numbers, okay? Sometimes we go, yeah, I'm doing pretty good and we're, because we're busy and life gets busy and we're not realizing, oh, we did have that donut and didn't go for my walk and you know, I've been sort of here and there with my medicine, or, or let's be positive, you know, I've been doing really well. I've gone for my walks and I'm uh, make, making these big beautiful salads and I'm taking my medicines and my numbers are good. So that's a good way to kind of evaluate how, how you are doing. All right, and subjective measurements, um, how do you feel? Again, it goes back to how do you feel? Only you can tell this to your provider, okay? They can't really look at you and be like, Oh, you know, well, maybe they can. <laughs> you look tired today. Or, um, you know, you're, you look lightheaded. You look like you're in pain. They can't always look at you and, and tell you. They're not mind readers. So this is something that we want you to um, be comfortable. And when the doctor says, hey, how are you doing? Don't say, fine. You know, when we pass people in the hallway and we're like, how's it going? Great, great. And then we keep going when there's like a thousand things going on. Um, hopefully you have a doctor that when they say, how's it going? You can sit down and say, well, this and this and this and this, and then you have some backup here, and um, they can, that will help them help you, okay? And I also tell my patients, um, when you sit down with your doctor, and actually this is, I'm kind of ahead of myself, but make sure you, you're, you're ready to go in and say, I have these questions. Because the doctor is not going to 
start talking to you. And I mean, we all know our visits are really short, right? But if you are staying on topic and you have questions and it's, it has to do with while you're there, they'll stay with you. And if they don't, I tell my, dog, my patients, go get the nurse, make sure your answers get answered. But if you do start to talk about fishing in the weather, they're gonna be like, okay, see ya. You know, we have a lot of things to do. So um, just helping to stay on topic. So in going through listening to our body, um, you know, one of, this is my, my, one of my patients a while ago, um, had gone through cardiac rehab, was doing great, had a great exercise program, was active, um, and was very consistent. And that's the key, and we'll talk about exercise in a little bit, but you have to be consistent with, with a, whatever you're doing so you get those benefits. Um, years later, they came to us and said, hey, you know, I had another stent put in. Can I come in? Yeah, sure. Come on in. We'll monitor you. We'll get you going, see what's going on. And he had mentioned during his, when he came in to talk to us, I had this loop that I would walk or a couple loops that he would walk. And during one part of the loops, he's like, I would just notice I got a little more short of breath. And I'm like, I shouldn't be, especially, you know, after you've exercised and your body's stronger and it's adapting. Um, there really shouldn't be too many symptoms. So he thought, you know what, I'm gonna call my doctor and see what's going on. And they found that his, another um, artery had closed up, so they were able to put a stent in. But good news, because they did this before there was any damage to the myocardium, that heart muscle, there was no damage. So they opened it up, the heart muscle's happy now, it's getting that blood flow, he didn't have any symptoms. Um, he got fixed up and back to his regular routine. Okay, so once you have coronary artery disease, you are, are at a higher risk of developing um, more disease in the arteries. And like, you know, Caitlin went over genetics, all these modifiable risk factors. Um, there are things that we have a lot of control over, and then there's that corner that we really don't know, and it's sort of a wild card. So this is how you pay attention and you are proactive in your health. Another thing I hear when folks come in, they go, I just thought I was getting older. So many times, I just thought I was getting older, you know, close to 70, I'm whatever, you know, whatever it might be. And then they go, I had a stent or I had a bypass, I feel great, okay? So just a reminder, it's never just because you're aging. Of course we're aging, we're all aging, our body is changing. But if you are noticing these symptoms, don't kind of push it off and say, well, it's just age, so that's kind of how it is, and sit there, sit back. Bring this up to your doctor. Talk to your family, somebody, like a friend, and then go, you know, no, maybe it's not. It could be early signs of a disease process. And if all your tests come back negative, awesome. It could just be deconditioning, okay? So it's getting our bodies back and moving so that we have more reserve to enjoy the day, to do what we want, to do the things that we have to do. All right. So a good takeaway is that you, you know yourselves the best. You, each person knows what they're um, ready to do, what they're willing to do, what they're able to do. And whatever doctor, clinician, nurse practitioner, whomever you see, that clinician studied that body part for, for years and years. So the idea is you bringing this information to them and then hopefully um, with the communication you have a good plan of care going forward. So this sheet is in your handout, and I do give this to all of my patients um, just as a template to say, hey, you know, when you go to see the doctor, write things down, okay? Provide information to them. Say, this is what I've noticed. Um, these are my questions I have for you. Something to kind of help so that, again, you stay on, on task, on topic, and if you stay on topic, they'll stay with you. Um, you don't have to fill out every single line, obviously, but it's there just to maybe jog your memory or thoughts. And before you leave that appointment, repeat back to the doctor what they said to you in your own words, okay? Because medical terminology, it's another language. Um, it's okay to say, what did you just say? Can you explain that in another way? Um, we want all of our patients, I want everyone to have um, the confidence to be their own advocate and to kind of understand. And part of that is learning and saying, what is that word? What does this mean? And then you're able to understand better and maybe put into play why um, the doctor created this plan. So say it back in your own words. 
and this will help them hear what you're saying so they can correct anything in the moment instead of you leaving and then thinking, oh, I got a call, and then you're kind of waiting that way, um, and express any concerns. So hopefully, again, you have a clinician that you are comfortable with just saying, here it is, here's everything. Um, and if not, you know, second opinions are okay. It's, they're human, people have different um, scopes of practice, they have different education, they have different um, uh, experiences that brought them to this place, and sometimes you're like, you know what, maybe another set of eyes wouldn't be too bad. So that's, that's okay too, okay? These next couple are, there's a lot of information, they're in your pack, and this is like what I give my patients, but sometimes people don't know what to ask. They're like, all right, that sounds great, but I, don't, I still don't know. So this, um, we give this to folks and say, you know, look through this, see if any of this goes, oh yeah, I did wanna kinda understand that better, or I wasn't sure about my cholesterol or my medication, uh, my blood pressure, physical activity. And these are really specific to cardiac rehab, um, risk factor management. Um, the things about medication too, I tell folks is, we do a whole medication lecture and we review the medicine, but I also tell patients to say, ask the doctor, what if I don't take this medicine? So that the patient can understand both sides of the coin and say, if I take it they, because it's good for this, but if I don't, what is my risk? Because ultimately the person's gonna go home and decide are they gonna do it or not, but at least they have the information um, there for them. And again, this is, it's too small to even see, but it's in your packet and it's just more questions. All right, and I did have um, one of our medical directors was like, yep, I know which one went through your class because she came with a list. I said, that's fantastic. Um, she's gonna know what's, what's going on. Okay, any questions or thoughts? <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, being proactive wouldn't be uh, like a test, like a calcium heart score. Um, that should be a pretty simple test, but I don't see it really, um, promoted um, oh the okay the question is about um, calcium heart, score. heart scores yeah so the doctors will decide based on your age your risk factors maybe symptoms maybe family history if that's a test that they're going to decide that would be right for you um, it's it it's a uh, scan that measures the calcium that's in your heart but not necessarily where in your heart so we don't really know if there's a blockage, but the, we just know that there's some, um, the calcium, the solidification with that vessel is present. And even when they get that number, they still have to, they'll run some more tests to see, you know, is this going to be harmful? Um, is it high enough where we're gonna be putting this person on medications so that their risk is less? Um, or perhaps it was nothing and that's good. So it's not one of their first, um, tests really, I think, unless you have a lot of risk factors, but it's very individual. If it's something that you've heard and you're interested in, I would encourage you to ask and see, and they can decide, yeah, you know, maybe that is good because of this, or they'll say, we haven't done it because of, and you'll get more clarity that way. <coughs> yeah. Um, the only way to know exactly where the blockages in are in your coronaries is to do the cardiac catheterization where they go in and actually look at the vessels. There's some, there's some very good tests that can kind of determine where they may be depending on how the heart's pumping. And um, if it's not pumping as well, it might not be getting oxygen from a certain vessel. But yeah, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, testing and hoops, I think, that you know, they have their different criteria to determine who, who needs what. But that's why questions, I think, are so important. Is a, uh, another opinion when you've got two of the experts and one says yes to do that and the other one says no, that, that becomes a toughie. So I lean on my RN daughter who works in med surge and cardio and what oh, she yeah. says. Yeah. But yet the experts are different opinions. Right. So, yeah, sometimes um, when you get a second opinion, she was saying that you'll, one person will say, yes, we need to do this, and another person will say no, and you go, oh, okay. <laughs> it's based on their experience. You know, they're going to say, based on what I know and what I've seen, which can be very different backgrounds for each doctor. So taking that knowledge, I mean, maybe a third opinion, or again, going back to you saying, all right, well, you know, I'm really not willing to do 
this plan of care based on this, so maybe that's not going to be good, you know, work out for you anyway. Um, and then maybe having a conversation with your primary care who knows all about you. Everything should go back to your primary and that's your hub and that might be another person to kind of bounce ideas off of and say, this is what I heard, you know, what do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, they're not always gonna agree. <laughs> so it might make the decision harder for, that's a, that's a chance, um, but it's just, it's, it's information. So um, sometimes more information is not always helpful, but sometimes it can be and I think that's where the sorting out um, from our individual standpoints comes in. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? All right. So, exercise, movement for a healthy heart, body, and mind. Um, what is the best kind of exercise out there? What do you guys hear? What do you think? Walking. 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 NPR just did a thing with Tai Chi. Okay, yes. For lowering high blood pressure. Yep, yep, yep. Any other things that you've heard or you're like, I know this is it, I know it is. Walking <laughs> IQT exercises. Yeah, yeah. The best kind of activity, anything that you will do consistently, that your body can safely do, that you can do consistently. When they say, this is the best, this is the best bike out there, this is the best treadmill out there, these are the best sneakers out there, they are trying to sell you something, okay? But if you know, well, walking's uncomfortable because of my, you know, orthopedic status or biking's uncomfortable or it's so bored, like I am not gonna do that, it's boring. It's not the best exercise for you. So whatever the best exercise activity is gonna be what you enjoy. Do you enjoy swimming? You know, do you enjoy going for a walk, for a hike? Do you enjoy being outdoors? Okay, those are the kind of things I would say, think about that before you go, yeah, they said I should get a uh, rowing machine because that'll be good for me. And you're like, I have no desire to row for an hour or what have you. Um, so think about like, are you a morning person? Are you, do you like later in the day? Do you like being outside indoors? Do you like doing things independently? Do you like um, doing group exercises? I mean, they have all these different options um, within town here. Um, do you enjoy, I mean, anything, okay? So what kind of regular activity do you engage in right now? I mean, you can answer this in your mind or you can answer out loud, it's up to you. Um, but I do want you to think about like, what, what do you do for regular exercise or activity? Because sometimes exercise sounds really intimidating and you're like, oh, exercise, because you have this thought. But um, what kind of activity, movement do, do you engage in? Another thing um, with this is maybe not, I, yeah, I don't really notice how much activity, but how much sedentary time do you have? We talked to that about our, uh, with our folks too. If you, it might be easier to track, yeah, I'm sitting in the car because I have a long commute and I sit at my office desk and then I'm tired at the end of the day, so I sit in a chair and watch TV and I sit when I, you know, all these things are like, I am quite sedentary. You know, looking at it from that point of view instead of saying, I'm not getting my exercise or, um, but just looking at an overview of what kind of day do you have going on, okay? Um, so wherever you are in your exercise, activity, um, physical movement spectrum, whatever um, challenges you may have with your health, um, physical, mental, um, whatever it might be, start where you are and start doing something. Okay, and do it slowly and gradually and consistently. And then you'll eventually go, oh, I, that feels comfortable now. I'm gonna do a little bit more. And that is really, that's really cardiac rehab. <laughs> Secrets out, that's cardiac rehab. We're like, where are, you? That's, where are you now? Look at all your numbers, how you're feeling. And then we just say, all right, let's get going. And if you start to feel tired, take a break. That might be after three minutes. That might be after five, it might be after 30, it might be after an hour, depending where you are and what you're doing. Um, but you wanna just start where you are, do a little bit, your body goes, oh, this person's challenging me, I'm gonna do a little bit more next time. And then next time you're like, oh, I feel a little bit stronger. Okay, take a recovery day, back up at it um, the next day, and then your body is, is getting stronger, okay? One of the things that, going back to the anatomy of the heart, 
um, and benefits of exercise. My favorite, favorite thing is that when you exercise, when we challenge you um, at a safe level and you're consistent and your body knows that it needs to adapt, is that our heart creates more collaterals. And our, I mean, all of our muscles, our skeletal muscles, they create more collaterals. And obviously that's helpful to feed um, the heart muscle. And the heart muscle is happy as long as it is being fed with your native vessel that you were born with, with a scented vessel, with a collateral vessel that you've created through um, some healthy supply and demand, or, or a bypassed vessel. And that's one of the things with cardiac rehab, we say, you know, just get moving, be consistent with your movement, and um, let your body adjust in that way. Just as an example, you know, you don't even have to start here. The beautiful thing about exercise is that it's really an art. Okay, so there's some, there's some fundamental um, things that we follow, but truly, like, you can make exercise whatever is meaningful, whatever is fun for you, and um, it, it can, you can be successful that way if you're consistent. Okay, obviously if you push too hard too fast, you know, maybe you're injured, now you're tired. Um, so making sure that you're pacing yourself as well. But usually we'll say start where you are, increase the duration. So now you did 10 minutes, maybe 12, maybe 15, and then, and you're doing it maybe twice a week. And then you go, I feel good when I do it twice a week. I'm gonna add another day, okay? So you're gradually building these behaviors so that you can continue um, lifelong um, with these healthy behaviors. There's, there's really nothing exciting or fat or flashy about this um, other than like getting into a nice regular rhythm that you can sustain, okay? Um, so any questions with that or like exercise progression overload? It's challenging yourself a little bit and your body will adapt to it. I mean, our bodies are, are quite miraculous. They can adapt to anything good, bad, or otherwise that we throw at it. It's always trying to survive. So um, working on these healthy behaviors, healthy patterns um, can help to, to strengthen us and improve our quality of life. Okay. So how can we add more movement in our days? And this is, this is not even exercise. When I talk about exercise, this is just moving more. So outside of your usual plain emotion, most of us as adults, we become, all right, um, we're gonna get out of bed, I'm gonna go and brush my teeth and I'm going to eat breakfast and then I'm gonna walk to my car, sit, and I'm gonna go to office and sit. I really didn't move too much out of this plane. So my body's really good at moving in this plane. However, it's not great at doing this or doing this or maybe lateral side to side, which is when we start to see imbalances and injuries start to happen, okay? I had a patient that told me I get down on the floor every day and then get up on the floor. And I was like, oh, okay. And she goes, just to make sure I can do it. <laughs> and I thought, that's actually genius, right? Because when you only move in one motion, that's what your body knows. That's how you're training without realizing it. You're training your body to be really good at relaxing. So we want to train and wake up those other muscles that allow us to, I mean, worst case scenario, if we fall, can we get back up on our own, okay? Um, walking on uneven surfaces. So again, all of this is within safety. So if you are very unstable, you know, maybe having walking poles, but walking on uneven surfaces, our, everything that we step on, it follows the chain up and our body has to adjust, okay? So it's just challenging all those smaller micro movements that we might not normally think about. Obviously driving less, taking the stairs, you know, you've heard that. Um, in the kitchen, chopping your own produce, using the whisk, okay? For, we have a lot of phenomenal gadgets. But those gadgets now take away our own moving and strength and um, we start to lose, we start to get weaker because of that. Okay, so think, when can I do, when can I do my own um, grating your cheese, right? I mean, I went to that and my family's like, it's so hard. I said, yeah, and you're using your muscles and actually you eat less because who wants to grate cheese <laughs> instead of just going to the bag. Um, but yeah, doing all those little, those motions and um, 
setting yourself up so you have to reach perhaps for something. Again, safely, maybe, maybe this is um, realistic and safe. This might not be safe yet, but when you're comfortable here, put it up a little higher, okay? Maybe um, instead of sitting on a chair this high all the time, you sit on a chair that's a little bit lower, and then when that's comfortable, you sit a little bit lower. So I don't want anyone to all of a sudden go, okay, well, she said to go out and do all these movements I've never done because, well, as we age, obviously our bodies start to kind of form in these um, patterns, but you can start to open up and break out of those patterns. Um, place the TV remote across the room. Okay, now you have to get up, change the TV, come back. And I have at the bottom here, move like a child. So um, my, my kids are eight and 10 and just observing them moving. And I think they, there is no stopping to what direction and how they're moving and how they're bending and twisting. And I thought, that's fantastic. At what point in our life do we just go from that to, all right, here we are sitting and then we're back home. You know, it happens. Um, but if you have kids, grandkids, family, friends, or just you're watching kids at the playground, just look at how they move and think, when's the last time I reached up over my head? Or I was, you know, they're going side to side or, you know, lifting up my knees higher than usual. Just all these different movements, okay? And then adding exercise, I mean exercise, again, activities to your usual tasks, okay? So, you know, maybe you're washing the dishes but you're standing on one leg, okay? You are waiting in line at the grocery store and you're kind of walking, tandem walking. Um, when you're driving your car, you know, we all kind of have this, we're looking at books, we have our phone, but we want to improve our posture. So we have the car seat behind us and we just kind of ramp our head and kind of push into the car seat as we're driving. We're like, yep, and I'm strengthening my, the back of my muscles. So there's a lot of little things that you can do to um, kind of work on those small muscles through the day. So there's this exercise, okay, nothing wrong with that, fantastic. Gets you out there, gets you moving, classes, whatever you desire. The Tai Chi, phenomenal ways to weight shift, going through different um, movements, slow and steady, especially with like balance and perhaps um, movements, that's we, movements that we haven't done in a while, nice and safe, okay? And then there's, there's this, have some fun with it. Have some fun with exercise. Um, you know, play the air guitar, you know, like have a dance party in your house. You're just moving different ways. Um, I mean, grapevine, you're like, oh, I have to go and brush my teeth, so I'm gonna do this side to side a little bit here. Have a counter, you know, for safety, safety that as well too. But these are all these movements that kids don't even think about, they just do. And they have beautiful range of motion. And it's not to say that every one of us can do part of some of these movements in here and start to incorporate them and have fun in your day, okay? So another thing, American Heart Association, it's, it's for kids. It says kids activities, but I think it's for everybody because anyone can do these. And I think when you start to have more fun, um, it helps our mental health too, which also helps with heart um, risk factors for cardiac disease and you're moving and kind of having fun. So yeah, arm circles, you know, lunges, but it's really, it's really limited only by your imagination. Um, there's really no wrong way. Again, um, safety, gradually, nice and slowly, listening to your body, all right? But yeah, these, these are not just for kids. These are for all of us in here to, um, the goal is to move more and move more of, of us. Okay, so yeah. Thanks. Any questions or thoughts? All right. Well, thanks for coming out. Really appreciate it.